Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram. Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Adhai Tadadhara Sri Vata Dhyara Bhakta Dhyara Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Vansha Karata Tarubhasya Prapasim Bhavayvata Patita Nama Pavarishna Vaishnava Dhyana Mona Maha Mukham Karoti Vachara Vipangum Mangayate Jive Yatsukata Maham Vande Shri Guru Nityanana Jai Grantara Shrimad Bhagavad Gita Ki. Jai. <clears throat> so welcome to the Bhagavad Gita study. Thank you, Mataji. We are doing... Today... Sorry? I said thank you, Mataji. You said welcome, so I, I'm saying thank you, Mataji. Hare Krishna. <laughs> so today we are um, 
we are in verse 17 of the um, sixth chapter entitled Dhyan Yoga, Mystic Yoga, the Eightfold Yoga System, Ashta Anga. Eightfold means there are eight different successive levels of practice, different parts of the practice, which begins with yam niyam. This is what we will talk about today, yam niyam, the do's and don'ts, certain practices which are favorable and certain practices which are unfavorable. So one has to first of all follow the do's and don'ts. And this is the, this, this, exist in all the yogas, even in bhakti yoga. When we study the nectar of devotion, we study the 64 angas of devotional service. And the first 20 angas are the 10 pravrities and the 10 nivrities. In other words, yam and niyam. Uh, 10 things that should be done, uh, practiced by a devotee, and then 10 things which should not be done. For example, one should associate with devotees. That is a to do. And then there is, one should not blaspheme the devotees. That is a don't. So in this way, even in devotional service, we know there are do's and don'ts. Uh, vidi and nishad, what is enjoined that we should do and what is forbidden because it is unfavorable to the practice of yoga. So yam niyam asana, as we know the practice of Ashtanga yoga involves different physical postures, all kinds of physical postures. Usually yogis can bend their body in all different directions, stand on the head for a very long time, stand on their toes for a very long time. They can bend, backwards, forwards. <laughs> and so they practice the asanas, different postures, yogic postures, um, uh, with the idea of uh, uh, controlling the senses and controlling the mind. Mm. The first goal of Ashtanga Yoga, yoga controlling the mind. Ashtanga Yoga has a lot to do with control. <clears throat> yam, niyam, asana. And then once one has mastered a position in which one can stay for many hours, uh, whether it is a sitting position, the lotus position, for example, everybody knows the lotus position, sitting crossed legs, <clears throat> or whether it is a standing position, like Dhruva Maharaj was standing um, on one leg. Mm -hmm. So once the yogi is comfortable in one particular position, which he has mastered, then he can practice pranayama or the control of the breath, where we are constantly breathing in fact, it is said that the number of our breath is counted. When we take birth, somewhere it is written how many trillions, millions times we are going to breathe. And when the number is exhausted, we say he has breathed his last. The air comes out at the time of death and it does not come in anymore. Last breath. So the yogis, they control the breath and um, they observe the breathing, the air coming in and out. And uh, they reduce the speed of the breathing. They can reduce the speed. We have seen that with Dhruva Maharaj, he was breathing every 12 days, the little sip of air every 12 days. Hmm? 
So they reduce and by doing so, because the number of breaths is connected to the duration of life by slowing down the breathing process, the yogis extend the duration of their life. So yogis can leave. Uh, you can still find somewhere some yogis. They are uh, 150 years old, 200 years old. It's quite rare that somebody can perfect the system. But if one does, then he can extend the duration of life. And this is required to attain perfection in Ashtanga Yoga, because it takes a very long time. What is the goal? We heard this, I think, in the previous verse. Um, was it the previous? Uh, two verses ago, it said, Matsthana Madhigachati. The actual ultimate goal of Ashtanga Yoga is to actually uh, enter the kingdom of God, to transfer oneself to the kingdom of God, which of course requires the addition of bhakti besides the mechanical practice of Ashtanga. So asana pranayama, pranayama, the control of the prana and of the life airs, which begins with the breathing control and the control of the life airs in such a way that the life airs are going to uh, come to a standstill. And then one will, there will be a phenomenon which is called pratyahara, pratyahara. And pratyahara means uh, the cessation of ahar. Ahar means, um, usually we say eating. Mm -hmm. Ahar, today the verse will talk about that, eating, but it is not only eating food. Ahar means taking in uh, from through all the senses, which involves actually the contact of the senses with the sense object. So pratyahara means that there is, there is a disconnection between the senses and the sense objects. And the yogi becomes isolated from the external world because of the cessation of the perceptions. And the yogi then internalizes his consciousness. That is pratyahar. He closes his eyes so it's not seeing. And the ears, the, the, the hearing process is no more taking place. He cannot hear anything. He, he enters the world of silence. And usually the yogi is reciting a mantra. So he only hears the mantra. He cannot hear the wind anymore. Remember the yogi is outside. He cannot hear the wind. He cannot hear the birds. He cannot hear anything, the river flowing. He cannot hear anything anymore. He doesn't see, he does not smell. Hmm? He does not taste. He does not feel the breeze on his skin, cannot. He has detached himself um, from the contact with the sense objects. And then having entered within himself, uh, he, the yogi begins the next thing after pratyahar, which is uh, dhyan, dharana, which is the meditation. It begins focusing the mind, usually following a mantra, following the sound, following the sound, following the sound, until uh, complete purification of the mind. And when the mind becomes like a mirror, then uh, reflecting not <laughs> all our anarthas, uh, but uh, through the medium of the mind, the purified mind, that the yogi sees the Paramatma. So we are hearing in this section, you have heard everything that, how he has to prepare the place, he has to choose a place, <clears throat> he has to prepare his seat, uh, where he is going to sit. And um, like that, he has to stand erect, uh, very important in yoga. Mm -hmm. uh, so, 
Now we are in text 17. In this section, we are actually studying yum yum, the do's and don'ts. Um, some restrictions, yum, the restrictions in the practice of yoga. And this is where Srila Prabhupada always pointed out that the yoga practices of the yoga studios in the Western world, in the modern world are useless. And it's just the cheating. It's simply cheating because they are doing the, yeah, the asanas and they are doing the pranayama, but they don't have what comes before. Huh? And uh, they don't observe the restrictions. They don't follow the rules of the game. The basic things are not there. So they can continue their breathing exercises for a long time. There won't be any much effect because <clears throat> we have heard uh, in the last verse, there is no possibility of one's becoming a yogi or a jyot. If one eats too much or eats too little, sleeps too much or does not sleep enough, and in this purple properly explain what does it mean to eat too much. It's not just eating too much in quantity, but it's also eating all kinds of unwanted foods, which are against um, the, um, what do you say, the attainment of the mode of goodness. And yoga is only practiced in the mode of goodness. And, uh, uh, so let us see what Krishna says today. Um, a little side effect today of practicing yoga is that it will bring good health, the mitigation of material miseries. Because material miseries, most of them are due to unregulated life. We are meant to live a regulated life. Everything in the universe is very regulated. The movement of the stars, the movement of the sun, the movement of the planets, the movement of the season, the passing of time, everything is so regulated. However, with the free will that Krishna has bestowed upon us, we live an unregulated life. And due to this unregulated life, we suffer the reactions. And what is the unregulated life connected to which kind of unregulated life? Well, here we see it is related to hmm, ahar, nidra, bhaya, metun, which is eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. If you observe usually animals like cow, they are very regulated. They will sleep whenever the sun goes down, they will go to sleep. But we are superior to animals. So when the sun goes down, we switch on the light. <laughs> and we are very proud of ourselves that we have switched on the life where all animals are sleeping as soon as the sun goes down. Yes. But if we follow the cycles of nature, this is very favorable for our mental balance, our emotional balance, and our physical balance. And as soon as we start interfering with our small little brain into the workings of the material universe, then we create disease. So, Yuktahara viharasya, yukta cheshtasya karmasu, yukta swapnava bodhasya, yogo bhavati dukkaha. This is what Krishna says here. He who is regulated in his habits of eating, sleeping, recreation, and work can mitigate all material pains by practicing the yoga system. So this is one of the mm, side effects of practicing Ashtanga yoga. It is dukkha. Dukkha means destruction. Ha, han. It means to destroy. What is destroy? Misery. 
misery is destroyed. Uh, so several things are mentioned here. Ahar. Ahar means eating. Unregulated habits in eating. And then vihara. Vihar means recreation, things that we do to relax. When they ask, oh, what do the yogis do for relaxation? Prabhupada explains the yogis, they go for a walk <laughs> because for hours and hours and hours they are sitting in the same position or standing in the same position. So for them, little recreation means go for a walk. So Srila um, Balade Vidya uh, Prabhu uh, mentioned that the recreation is required for a human being. It's a kind of a time of relaxation when we are not really focusing on anything, we just relax, which involves various activities according to people. But Srila Balade Vidya says that relaxation, uh, recreation, mm -hmm. Uh, must be favorable. There are all kinds of recreation, like if for your recreation, you go to these places where they have all these electronic games, you know, and uh, for an hour you are shooting at uh, some kind of little personalities on the screen. That is not favorable for yoga. Uh, after doing this, you become nervous and you, you kind of, uh, even it is said it's cultivating violence in people. So this is not the kind of recreation. Recreation should be in the mode of goodness, hmm. which means basically something which is harmless, which does not involve sense gratification in an extravagant way, um, which is not sinful, hmm, which does not harm the body. So, and then it says yukta chestasya, uh, a one who works for maintenance, meaning that Srila um, Baladevi also explains that one should be re re uh, regulated in both material and spiritual activities, not just one side, both sides. Because as long as we have this material body, uh, we do have some activities for the maintenance of the body, which are so-called material. We can um, just say dovetail them, Prabhupada used that word. We can dovetail them by engaging everything in the service of Krishna. Mm -hmm. um, so for a devotee, there's hardly any material activity. But um, in any case, Activities such as eating, for example, sleeping, uh, must be regulated. They can be connected to Krishna, we will see in the purport how, but they should be in general regulated. Um, and besides the activities, also the sleep and wakefulness. There has to be a balance uh, between the sleep and wakefulness. So I have been trying to practice this for many years now, never succeeded. So <laughs> it is not obvious to be a yogi at all. So that's why Srila Prabhupada criticizes. This comes first. After that comes asana. This comes first. One has to place oneself uh, situate oneself in the mode of goodness. Uh, regulation belongs to the mode of goodness. So extravagance, Srila Prabhupada says, in the matter of eating, sleeping, defending, and mating, which are demands of the body, can block advancement in the practice of yoga. So and regulation, when we act very whimsically and do not actually adhere, uh, as I said, to the regulations of the universe and we are not following time, we are not doing things on time, uh, this blocks the advancement in yoga. 
And in the purple, Shila Prabhupada, of course, this purple is a typical purple mood and mission. Prabhupada is not talking exactly of Ashtanga Yoga in the purple. He is saying how these things apply to a devotee practicing Bhakti Yoga and how a devotee in Bhakti Yoga achieves uh, the proper um, use of this eating, mating, sleeping, uh, defending um, through the practice of Bhakti Yoga, which involves engagement in the service of Krishna. Whereas the yogi or, or Ashtanga Yoga involves control over these activities. So the devotee is not overly trying to control his own activities. He is not concerned with controlling his activities. Devotee is concerned with Krishna's service. And because the devotee is completely absorbed in Krishna's service, then all these regulations, they happen, uh, they happen automatically. So here we say, Srila Prabhupada said, for example, he gives example. How is the eating process controlled for the devotee? Uh, simply because what is the way to control our eating? Meaning eating means we already heard in one of the previous purports uh, that the urge of the tongue, which is unfavorable, for yoga or for living a balanced life in communion with nature, which will lead to communion with the Supreme. Uh, it includes uh, not taking animal food, not drinking, uh, not smoking. Shira Prabhupada says, smoking is part of the urge of the tongue. There's a taste in smoking. And uh, eating all kinds of, sucking all kinds of things, or people eat, they keep tobacco in, in, their, in, uh, in their mouth. People drink wine, beer, whiskey, vodka, <laughs> whatnot. Uh, so these are, all um, activities which are part of the eating process are the urge of the tongue. What is the urge of the tongue? The urge of the tongue is to taste. The tongue wants to taste palatable foods, drinks, and so on, which includes smoking. So for those who are not devotees, they have to restrain it's so hard, we have to restrain uh, these activities. But for a devotee, actually it becomes so easy because a devotee wants to please Krishna and the devotee uh, is, takes the position of a servant and does not want to do anything which um, does not please the Lord. And in terms of eating, and many other things, the devotee only accepts prasadam. And prasadam means food offered to the Lord. And the Lord has his preference. It's like when you, you invite somebody at your home to eat, uh, you, you, you wonder or you ask them or you think what would please them? What kind of food do they like? So the devotee does not cook for his own sake. The devotee cooks for Krishna. So what would Krishna like? Hmm. He says it in the Bhagavad Gita. Patram pushpam phalam toyam. And Prabhupada explains this, that Krishna actually says that he wants vegetables, Patram, what is that? Patram means leaves. Of course, sometimes it is interpreted as tulasi leaf that satisfies Krishna. Just one tulasi leaf will satisfy Krishna. But patram also uh, refers to all kinds of vegetables, leafy vegetables, all kinds of vegetables. 
And then flowers. Mm -hmm. uh, we eat flowers, yes, yes. Pumpkin flower, pumpkin flower pakora, mm -hmm. banana flower sabji. So in that way, we eat the flowers also. Uh, fruit, all kinds of fruit, grains, milk, etc. Mm -hmm. So this is what Krishna wants. He doesn't say, give me, you know, cut the goat's uh, throat and give me a goat in, uh, for, for my meal, mm -hmm. or give me some meat, give me some fish, give me some eggs, give me uh, things like that. No, that, that, that's, this is offered, this is offered to other personalities. Uh, and even they sometimes do not even accept. Kali, Ma Kali, is worshipped uh, by the offering of, of decapitated uh, animals. Uh, um, but it is said even that Kali does not even accept these offerings because she is a Vaishnavi. One of her names is Durga Vaishnavi. Uh, Kali is an expansion, a form of Durga. So Durga is a devotee of the Lord. She doesn't accept this kind of things. And it is said that all these offerings are actually eaten by all her associates, which are ghosts and goblins and all kinds of demoniac beings. They take the offering. Hmm. She gives it to them. They take it. And so when people eat that kind of prasadam, <laughs> they are actually eating ghost uh, prasadam, mm -hmm. remnants, ghost remnants, demoniac beings, remnants. So Lord Vishnu or Krishna is Sattvatanu, or he is the form of goodness. His form is the form of goodness. And it's not even material goodness. It is Shuddha Sattva, pure goodness. And he can only be worshipped in goodness. So everything that Prabhupada is mentioning here, the vegetables, flowers, fruits, grains, they are in goodness. Meat is in ignorance. Wine is in ignorance. These are things which um, dull, make our consciousness very dull. Everybody knows you drink wine after some time, you don't know who's your father, who's your mother, who's your brother, who's your wife, who's your husband, you have no clue. So it is tamasic. And the Lord, Lord Vishnu, is not worshipped with these things. So one who becomes a devotee of Lord Vishnu, and who worships Lord Vishnu is trained to offer foods in the mode of goodness to Lord Vishnu and then partake of the prasadam. So there is no question for a devotee. If any devotee gives, uh, receives, sorry, some eatables, first thing he will ask, is it offered? Mm. This is a question always that devotees are asking. Yeah? Um, is it offered? If it is offered, happily, whatever it be, sweet, salt, sour, any taste, if it is offered, oh, my Lord's mercy, you yeah, take it. And if the answer is no, it is not offered, oh, not interested, because I am a servant of the Lord. After he eats, I eat. If he hasn't eaten, that's not for me. I don't accept. And devotees become so trained, and it's not even a question they become trained initially. And ultimately, it is the training transformed into a, a way of life. If it's not offered, it's not eatable. Wine cannot be offered to Vishnu, therefore, Devotees do not drink wine. Similarly, mushrooms are tamasic because they, um, let you say, they grow without 
light. So they are in the darkness. They are creatures of darkness. They cannot be offered to Lord Vishnu. Therefore, devotees do not eat mushrooms. So like this, all kinds of foods are automatically, the tongue is controlled. This otherwise very uncontrollable jiva in the tongue for devotees is very easily controlled. Is it offered? No. Finished. Not eatable. It becomes very easy for a devotee to control the tongue by the mercy of Krishna. Then Prabhupada said, sleeping. Hmm? How do the devotees control sleep? The yogis have their mechanical way to control sleep and reduce the sleep so that they can spend maximum time in meditation. How do the devotees control sleep? Well, devotees have no time to sleep. <laughs> Imagine you are a very uh, busy business person, mm. you're a businessman, you're extremely busy. So there's never enough time during the day. You are, you are rushing to your office and you are making calls, taking calls, meeting your assistants, you have business meetings, business journeys, just so busy. You have dinners and luncheons and so many things. And then one day, <laughs> you find the back of a Gita. <laughs> and then you meet the devotees of Krishna. And then they train you up in sadhana bhakti. And on top of all your busy schedule, now you have to spend two hours a day chanting Hare Krishna. <laughs> and before eating, you have to take the time offering the food mm -hmm. and every day you have to read <laughs> and then you have to observe the Vaishnava festivals and just so many more things to do before you only had a material life after becoming a devotee you also have a spiritual life there is no time to sleep and for those devotees who do not even have a material life, but who simply engage in Krishna's service 24 hours a day, Prabhupada gives the example of Srila Rupa Goswami, Sri Haridas Thakur, Srila Rupa Goswami. How many hours was he sleeping? We are hearing. Nidra hara vihara kadi vijitao. The Goswamis of Vrindavan had conquered over eating and sleeping. They ate hardly anything and they slept two hours per day. We heard of Bhaktivinoda Thakur also sleeping two hours a day. And even our Srila Prabhupada was hardly sleeping. Usually he would be awake until 10, 11. And then at one o'clock, Srila Prabhupada would wake up. He would clean his mouth, his feet, his hands, his face, and he would sit and chant, Hare Krishna, 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 Krishna. Hare Ram, 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 Ram. In the dark, with just a little light, he would chant. And after chanting, he would open all his books and he would write. He would write and write and write for several hours in the night. So where did he sleep? Maybe a little nap in the afternoon, very short. So Prabhupada explains that the devotees are so eager to serve. They're so eager to serve that they cannot waste a moment. It is called avyarta kalatvam. That always not wasting time. So these are very 
these are stages of existence which are attained by the advanced devotees. Busy, busy moment by moment in the service of Krishna. And why does a devotee sleep at all? A devotee sleeps simply uh, to allow the body to refresh itself. The body has some functions that need to be performed during sleep. The organs uh, are flushing themselves during sleep. So just in order to keep this body functional, the devotee sleeps. Otherwise, there's no interest in sleeping. It's sleeping is a waste of time, Sri Prabhupada. This is sleeping is a waste of time. There is so much to do in the service of Krishna. There is, this sleeping is an interruption of the service. You have so many things to do and then pff, you have to go to sleep. And so many hours. So what is the recommendation for all yogis, including bhakti yogis? Maximum six hours of sleep. That is for the conditioned devotee. For the enlightened devotees, two hours, sufficient. But for us, if we do not sleep enough, what will happen? We won't be able to meditate. We will fall asleep even while eating prasada. We will fall asleep in all circumstances. As they say, always, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Hmm? It's like a lullaby. <laughs> as soon as devotees hear that mantra, immediately they go to sleep. Because hmm? we woke up very early in the morning and uh, uh, woke up very early in the morning and then attended the function at 4.30 in the morning in the temple for almost an hour, singing praise of the Lord, then sitting for japa a little bit. And then there is Guru Puja, there is Darshan, there's so many things in the temples that happen. And then comes the Bhagavatam class. And by the time the Bhagavatam class comes, if one has not slept, six hours, then what happens? You know, the rest of the program was okay. During Japa, you were walking back and forth in order not to sleep. The rest of the time you were standing, so one rarely falls asleep while standing. But as soon as you sit, then finished, <laughs> conquered. So if one wants to be functional, it should not sleep too much, but it should also sleep not too less. Huh? So it's very important for devotees to try to regulate that. Even though we are very busy at the same time, we must make sure that we get enough sleep. Hmm? The idea is that a yogi is balanced. Hmm. Yogi is regulated, balanced. Prabhupada says, unnecessary time spent sleeping is considered a great loss. Note as well that, however, when you go to the Ayurvedic doctor, he will tell you that according to one's prakriti or one's nature, one needs more or less sleep. But Srila Prabhupada put it to six hours. It's six hours sleep and then two hours to take care of the body to eat, to bathe. Hmm. One needs about two hours a day. So that's eight hours all together, which are given to the body. In the Ishopanishad, Shri Prabhupada says that this body uh, is a mass of ignorance. Sharira vijjajal. Mm -hmm. What is the sharira, the body? Avidyajal. It is a network of ignorance. It is made of ignorance, the material nature, the material elements. They are ignorance, materialized, basically. 
Um, so we give eight hours to this body. And if we give more to this body than eight hours, um, it means we are absorbed in the bodily concept of life. So we have to minimize that. And then the rest of the time, see, uh, Prabhupada actually divided the time, the, the day of a devotee into three. Mm -hmm. So there should be eight hours of body activities, eight hours of sadhana. <clears throat> Uh, not always achieved, but that means there are two hours minimum for chanting and one can chant more. And then there is worship. We spend time in worshiping. And then there is hearing the scriptures, reading. So all these things are transcendental activities, <clears throat> remembering the Lord and so on. So these are our direct spiritual activities in which we need to engage every day. And then there is service, service to the Lord, eight hours of service. This is how Srila Prabhupada told us to divide our time. Um, and as far as work, Srila Prabhupada says, First, he talks of Haida Stako. said for him, so one thing, two things that protect the devotee from extra sleep. One is there is so much service to do for Krishna. There's no end. So much service is there and the devotee is very eager to serve. So there is no time to sleep extra. <clears throat> Secondly, the sadhana is there and there is to chant. Prabhupada gives the example of Haridas Thakur. His quota for chanting was very high. He was chanting practically the whole day. And he had a quota. And as long as he had not finished his quota, then he would not sleep. So the devotees between seva and sadhana, their life is completely full. There is no time for extra sleep. And what is the consequence of extra sleep. Sleep is tamasic. It is, it again, makes our consciousness dull. So if we spend too much time sleeping, then even when we are awake, the influence of sleep will continue and our consciousness will not be clear. Our thinking process will be foggy. Mm -hmm because we have accumulated the influence of ignorance. And that is one of the main reasons why the spiritualists minimize sleep, because sleep is pure ignorance. And we want to walk the path of sattva, which leads to enlightenment. So therefore the sleep has to be controlled and minimized, but not so much minimized <laughs> that the body becomes disturbed and the bodily functions become disturbed. So each and every person has to find their balance with sleep, that how much is necessary and sleep that much. And basically necessary means that one can function the whole day without falling asleep at every step. If you start falling asleep at every step, you must understand that. You're not sleeping enough. And that is not favorable for yoga. We have to balance. Then Prabhupada says, as far as work is concerned, a Krishna conscious person does not do anything which is not connected with Krishna's interest. And therefore work is regulated. It's regulating in, ter in, in terms of how much we work, but also in terms of the kind of work that we perform. No ugra karma or activities which are destructive uh, or which are simply um, overly uh, aimed at sense gratification. Devotees' activities aim at pleasing Krishna. Um, so this is the life of a devotee. 
And the conclusion Prabhupada says, because one is regulated in all his work, speech, sleep, wakefulness, and other bodily activities, there is no material misery for him. As we said, dukkha, the mitigation of all material misery. So, and this is in the present, and this is also for the future. Uh, whatever we do, we will uh, reap the fruit of it. So if we live a life which is healthy and balanced, then the future for, health, for us is good health. And if we live an unbalanced life, then the future for health for us is disease, which is not, it is dukkha. It is part of the material miseries. So the life of a devotee is also uh, the life of a yogi. And uh, we can take a lot of inspiration from this chapter six, actually, for our own practice in Krishna consciousness. This simple living that Sri Prabhupada advocated. And this is the life of a Nashtanga yogi, living very simply. No overindulgence in any way, in anything. Too much of anything is uh, not good. So, um, so as devotees, we follow many of the things which are um, the habits of Nashtanga Yogi. And when we chant Hare Krishna, we are also um, uh, practicing some of the things which the Ashtanga Yugis are also practicing. Chanting means withdrawing. We talked of this Pratyahara. Uh, uh, chanting means withdrawing the consciousness from the external world. When we chant, we are also hearing a mantra and we are following the mantra. Hmm? When we chant, sometimes somebody is calling us and we are not hearing because we are hearing the mantra. And uh, when, we, when we chant, uh, we are not thinking of eating, sleeping, um, uh, enjoying. No, we are absorbed in the chanting. So this is called uh, meditation. This is dhyana. What we are practicing, the chanting of Hare Krishna, is a form of meditation. But it is not the silent meditation of the yogi. It is um, a meditation which uh, involves using our senses uh, to glorify the Lord. But many of the rules of Ashtanga Yoga apply in chanting, such as, for example, sitting straight. Sitting straight uh, brings in the mode of goodness. If you sit like this, immediately ignorance will come. You will lose the concentration. If you sit straight while chanting Japa, there will be more concentration. It is automatic. These are laws of nature. That's why it was recommended a few verses before that the yogi must sit in a straight position with the a body, the back and neck erect in one line. Why is that? Because at that time, the flow of breathing is very um, clear. And this promotes the mode of goodness, which means that it sends away the sleep, ignorance. It also helps controlling the incessant waves of thinking, feeling, willing, which are born from the mode of passion. So as uh, actually the practice of bhakti includes elements from all the other yogas. Bhakti yogis are very actively engaged in practical services for the Lord. This is like the karma yogis who are very, very they are very active. So the devotees also have that part of karma yoga, which is activity. We are full of activity. 
And as far as Jnana Yoga, yes, devotees constantly hear. They constantly feed their intelligence uh, and they constantly discriminate uh, between the material identity and the spiritual identity. So the ego devotees are jnanis because bhakti is, is practiced on the basis of jnana, of knowledge. After many, many lifetimes, bahunam janmanam ante jnanavan mam prapadyate. After many, many, many years um, uh, of cultivating knowledge, one finally comes to the conclusion that Vasudev is everything and one surrenders unto him. So devotees have knowledge, they study, they hear, and they discriminate between matter and spirit, definitely. Recently, I was speaking with a devotee who was saying that sometimes I, you know, there's so much pullings and pushings in the, in the consciousness that one wonders uh, whether one, one should actually engage in some material activity or one should establish some material relationship. Or, and, but then um, that devotee was saying that, uh, but no, then I, my intelligence comes to my help and says, no, 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 I shall not do that because I want to meet Krishna. That is my goal. I want Krishna as my friend. I want Krishna as my lover. I want Krishna as my Lord. I want him. And in order to attain him, I must you know, uh, go beyond all the demands of this body and mind. So in this way, the devotees are situated in jnana. Their intelligence guides them. And the devotees are also Ashtanga yogis because every day they practice meditation on the Maha Mantra. And meditation means concentration. That's why Prabhupada always said, always says, be attentive. He's talking of attentive chanting. What is attentive chanting? It is dhyana. It is meditation. So we meditate on the sound of the Maha Mantra. And like a yogi, a Nashtanga yogi, we follow the sound. We follow the sound and we follow the sound. But whereas in Ashtanga yoga, the following of the sound is very mechanical. In Bhakti yoga, not only we follow the sound, but we have an intention, we have a meaning, and we have a feeling. We are searching for the Lord. We are not just following a mantra. We are calling out for the Lord. It's a mantra with a meaning. So in this way, Bhakti Yoga is fully complete. It integrates all the other yogas. And it is the topmost yoga. It integrates the practices of all the other yogas, and it helps us to reach the goal of all the other yogas. The goal of karma yoga is to become detached. So the, the devotees are naturally detached. Is it offered? Not offered. Naturally detached. There is no... You don't have to force yourself as a devotee. Oh, I can't eat it because it's not offered. Devotee doesn't, never thinks like this. Not offered, finished. Detached. Very naturally. And the devotee is situated in knowledge because he engages in devotional service, which is the activity of the soul not the activity of the body. Chanting Hare Krishna is the activity of the soul. So the devotee is fully actually identified as the soul. Of course, we forget a little bit here and there. <laughs> Sometimes my, the consciousness becomes a little bit overwhelmed, but we come back. No, 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 Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. We come back and, and 
basically we the to be a bhakti yogi means to be situated in one's eternal identity as a soul there is no practice of body without that and of bhakti without that understanding bhakti is beyond uh, uh, as you say material understanding it is based on the understanding that I am the soul. One who understands that can communicate with the Lord. All right, so we will stop here. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Mataji, there are some questions. Is it possible for us to ask you a few questions? Yes, a few questions, yes. So tell me when to stop because I know it is very late and I don't want to give yeah, you... Yeah, okay. Carry on. We'll go up to 10 and something. Let's see how many questions are there. Okay. So the first question is, Hare Krishna, Prashanta Mataji, please accept my humble obeisances, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Could you please talk a little more just how can we obtain long uh, breathing practices? Hare Krishna. <laughs> yeah, well, these are not the practices of the bhakti yogis. We are not so much into uh, the breathing practices. Uh, breathing practices, I think last time when I was giving class, I said they are useful sometimes to control outbursts of emotion, or to control our thoughts. But as back to yogis, we are not so much in, interested in that, in controlling the breath, because our process is not mechanical. Our process is personal relationship with Krishna. It's not mechanical. It is. Uh, it's a different process. But the control of the breath, we can say, is also involved with the chanting of Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is a way to chant Hare Krishna, which is that you inhale fully and then you chant as many mantras as there you can fit into an exhaling breath. And then again, you inhale fully and then you chant. Uh, um, it helps in concentration, definitely. Breath is very powerful. It's very, very powerful in controlling the mind. So we, we just breathe and, and in the exhale, exhalation, so many maha mantras are coming. And then you inhale and then you exhale and then you inhale and then you exhale. You can do that when you chant Hare Krishna. But note that uh, someone like Haridas Thakur is chanting when you exhale you chant loud and when you inhale you chant in your mind and that way there is no interruption of the uh, Maha Mantra that is the practice of those who are who do the uh, Kirtaniya Sada always chant Hare Krishna so when you exhale, you can speak the Maha Mantra. When you inhale, you can pronounce it uh, on Manasa, Manasa, in the mind. So if you practice that, it, it helps concentration. So you can do that when you chant in the morning. Thank you, Mataji. Another question is, uh, that question was from Ray Ramlal. Uh, Prabhuji. Um, now the second question is from jo Jolly Mataji and she's saying Hare Krishna Mataji, can you explain why prasadam is firstly offered or sanctioned by Lord Vishnu? Thank you. Um, first of all we do not offer prasadam we offer bhoga. Mm -hmm. We offer the food and then it becomes prasad. Prasad means mercy means it descends upon us and it's very beneficial purifying for us it's the mercy of the lord his compassion upon us blessed food 
is explained in the Bhagavad Gita that actually everything in the world is a transformation of what you say, it's an energetic expansion of Krishna. It's not different from him. And Krishna is the owner of everything. sarvam. Yet jagatyam jagat, whatever is within this universe, whether animate or inanimate, it belongs to the Lord and it's controlled by him. Who can deny control of the Lord in this world? Who can deny control? Everything is, as we said, so regulated. Uh, uh, as if there was no one in control. This is what the atheists are thinking. There's no one in control. Then why is there control? Everything should be a chaos. Control means there is a controller. So because everything belongs to the Lord, uh, anyone who takes anything without acknowledging his ownership by offering it, offering it unto him is considered a thief. So why we offer food to the Lord? First, because this is the process that Krishna is telling us. He's saying you must offer before you take. You must remember that it's mine, it's not yours. We are users, we are not owners. Or we could say we are secondary owners. Like when you have a book, so some people, they buy a book, they put their name on it. But some other people, they will put care of. It is in care of such and such person. It is in, in my care. Whatever I have has been given to me in my care. And I care for it. That's my duty. It's my service. Krishna has given me a little portion of the creation. Mm. For some people, it's, uh, what do you say, 10 feet by 10 feet. They live in a little room. And for some people, it's a big mansion. This mansion does not belong to us, really. Yeah. Why? Because we didn't make it. We didn't create it. The owner is the creator. And we don't create anything. We transform energy but we don't create energy. So therefore we cannot actually claim ownership. So when we use the things of this world without acknowledging the ownership of the Lord, we create karma, karma bandhana, bondage by work. Everything we do, which is simply aimed at our own satisfaction, we do it self-centeredly and therefore a reaction will come. Everyone knows that this world is full of action and reaction. If there was no reaction after going to work for the whole month, what is the reaction of working for the whole month is that you get a salary. If there was no salary, who would go to work in all these ugly places? So we work for the fruit. The fruit is the reaction to our work, the product of our work. So everything we do produces a reaction. And if we eat hmm, things um, simply uh, for our own pleasure, hmm, um, then we get the reaction of killing, killing the vegetables, killing the animals, killing the fish, killing everything for the sake of eating. So Krishna says that before you eat, you offer it to me. And then you accept the remnants. By offering it to Krishna, uh, instead of performing an action which is self-centered, we perform an action which is Krishna-centered. And all the reactions which are there mm, uh, in having killed, even if it's a carrot, uh, these reactions are absorbed by Krishna. And the prasadam that we get is karma-free. There is there's no 
uh, karmic involvement for us with that food. So that's why we offer everything to Krishna. Because when we create karma, it means we are creating our next birth. Our body is made of karma, of the karmic reactions that uh, we have accumulated in our previous lives. So if we want to end uh, uh, our time in this material world, we must not create more reactions so that if we don't create reactions, there won't be another body. So this is why we are offering the food. And of course, there's another reason why we are offering the food is that we consider that Krishna is here. For the devotees, Krishna is present. Krishna is here. And so we like to feed him. We feed him. And we are his servant. So we don't need before him. Just as in traditional societies, sometimes we see that the wife will not eat before the husband has eaten because she considers herself a servant of her husband and she cooks for him and then she serves him. And when he's finished or almost finished, then she starts taking. She will also sometimes not eat before the children have eaten. This is an act of love. So we also offer the food because we want, uh, we want that exchange with Krishna. We want to feed him. Thank you, Mataji. Hare Krishna. Another question is, um, uh, Hare Krishna, uh, thank you for this wonderful uh, lecture. In today's date, all vegetables and fruits are contained uh, and many times we don't even know the source of it. So, I can't read this. Sorry, Mataji. I think you meant contaminated, I'm not sure. Okay. Yes, contaminated mm -hmm. and many times we don't know the source of it. So what we should do before offering our cooking, Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. <clears throat> This is why Srila Prabhupada wanted so much that we develop farm communities. We know that this was one of Prabhupada's, um, let me say, it was one of Srila Prabhupada's uh, desires that we create farm communities so that we can grow our own food, pure, to offer to Krishna. Um, but, uh, you know, it's called making best use of a bad bargain. What can we do? Yes, everything around us is polluted. I had a, a devotee friend from Bangalore who is uh, uh, working from a Korean company. So, so uh, repeatedly he has to go to Korea to work there and come back. And um, and then one day I was having a, a, like this a Zoom call with, with him and his wife and I said, oh, Prabhu, you've lost so much weight because <laughs> he had been for one month in Korea. He said, you lost so much weight. And, and the wife who was with me said, yeah, he doesn't, he just he cannot eat. There's nothing. He's just eating kitchari every day, just little rice and that, that he carries in his suitcase. When he goes there, he takes rice and flat rice and puffed rice <laughs> and the dal. And he's eating that there. And I said, well, what about vegetables? At least you can buy vegetables and, and eat vegetables, you know, because he was saying you can't eat anywhere here. Everywhere is meat. You can't eat anywhere at all. And so I said, what about the fruit and vegetables? He said, yeah, initially when I came, I, I used to buy fruit and vegetable until I discovered that the, mm, the, the vendors uh, and they actually sprinkle the, their products, their, whatever they have, fruits, vegetables, they sprinkle them with something which is unclean. Huh? 
um, connect it with some animal product or something. And so after that, so that's it. I can't even eat that. So you stop taking the vegetables and the food. Uh, so it's very difficult. But uh, this problem was there when Srila Prabhupada was in America and Europe in the 70s, you know, when he was preaching. He, Prabhupada arrived in the end of the 60s and he was, he was especially preaching in the 70s. And at that time, the devotees already had pointed to Srila Prabhupada that white sugar, for example, in the West, they have something called crystal sugar. It's like white crystals, very, very white, and uh, it's very sugary. So it's, it's uh, what do you say, um, you know, if you have seen the, I visited one time a factory of, uh, how from sugar cane to white sugar, you know, how there's a whole process to transform the sugar cane juice into white sugar. But there are further processes which are done in factories by which they use some kind of, uh, they use um, bones uh, from the slaughterhouses and they use all kinds of products from the slaughterhouses to actually make the sugar white. Hmm? So the devotees discovered this, that actually the sugar is contaminated. The milk is contaminated. In the West, you buy all these you know, boxes of milk. And what is it exactly? You don't know. It's, it's not really milk. It's not that they just came from the, the, the cow. <laughs> no, no, no. It has gone through transformation. And then they have additives. They add vitamins and this and that. And where the, do these things come? Usually, many things are based on animal products, uh, so it's not even eatable. You buy the yogurt in many Western places. The yogurt, you devotees cannot take that yogurt. It's made with it's made made with rennet, which is um, some a fluid which is found in the stomach of the calf. So they kill the calves and then they take the stomach and they extract. The, this liquid and then they use it for coagulation. So it's very difficult. So these things existed when Sri Prabhupada was there. But um, two things. One thing is that Prabhupada said that it will be purified by the offering and because we are using it. He said, we can't make halava without sugar. We can't make halava without sugar. So just use it. And, uh, but at the same time, Srila Prabhupada said, open farms and make your own sugar, make your own milk, produce your own food. So on one hand, sometimes we have to adjust, but the, the general direction that Prabhupada gave was to actually produce uh, food so that we can live without that contamination. So as devotees, well, yes, we do, we should not be lazy. It doesn't matter. They say in India, it doesn't matter. Everybody knows everything is contaminated and Krishna will eat the, <laughs> you know, the contamination and we'll get the pure prasana. We should not be neglectful. Sometimes we cannot avoid you know, there are certain products like this that somehow many things are like candles, for example, are very dirty unless they are vegetable, vegetable candles. Otherwise, candles are very dirty. And there are many things like this. Uh, one time I was, you can explore. So the, the good things about the consumer society is that there are uh, societies which are analyzing everything. You can go on internet and you can find out about all kinds of products and you can find out whether they are vegetarian or they are not vegetarian. So we should make that effort to give Krishna the best that we can find. And we sometimes have to change our habits. 
Like for example, you use prickly powder you know, what is that called? Talcum, talcum powder has been used for centuries in human society. And it's supposed to be a ground, grinded stone, talcum. Oh yes, that's what it used to be. But today they found again, that if you grind bones from the slaughterhouses, you also obtain a white powder, which is also good for absorbing humidity and sweat and all this. So most of these powders that people buy are not vegetarian. They come from the slaughterhouse. So actually as devotees, um, you know, even those who are not devotees, those who are vegans, you know, they, you research and you try to offer something pure to Krishna with the understanding that you may not always make it a hundred percent because in this age of Kali, everything is contaminated. So the policy is do your best, avoid things that you absolutely know they are unclean. You can give them up. There are, you know, there is substitute and there is also, as we say, simple living. It's not that we have to eat everything that's on the market. No, you can select. You can select and make wonderful preparations from whatever you find, which is pure. So vegetables, you know, yes, so many things are happening. You wash them as much as possible. As I said, you do your best. You do your best and if you really want to change life, you go to the countryside, buy a piece of land, buy a cow and be happy. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Uh, Mataji, we are mindful of time, but there are two more questions. Yes. Uh, okay. So one is, uh, the first question is from uh, Ray Ramlal Prabhuji, and he's um, uh, saying that uh, in uh, Srimad Bhagavatam Canto 1, Chapter 6, Lord Chaitanya confirms as follows, the change of dress is only a formality. And he did not accept the name of a sannyasi. What, your comments in this regard is appreciated. Hare Krishna. So this is in regards to Lord Chaitanya, right? Yes, yes, Prabhupada. Yes, so in other words, the Lord does not need, uh, the Lord is beyond, first of all, the Chaturvarna. The Lord is beyond that. He doesn't belong. The Chatur, the Chatur Varna, the four Varnas and the four ashrams. Sanyas is an ashram. Uh, they are meant for the conditioned soul. Those who are liberated, they are beyond these four divisions. And the Lord is ever liberated. He's the giver of liberation. So he doesn't belong to any of these categories. And we know the reason why Lord Chaitanya uh, actually um, took sannyas, not because uh, uh, he needed to take sannyas or he wanted to take sannyas. He just took sannyas so that people would not commit offenses against him. That was his compassion that he took sannyas because people were uh, decrying him, they were criticizing him for what he was doing because, you know, nowadays even we get <laughs> uh, criticized for chanting on the streets and being dressed the way we dress. And so, what to speak of Lord Chaitanya because he is the first one who was chanting Hare Krishna on the streets. Nobody did that before, you see. At least uh, when you go out and chant Hare Krishna, people understand, oh, it's a Hare Krishna. <laughs> because they have already heard about Hare Krishna. But when Lord Chaitanya got on the street, nobody had ever seen anything like this. Dancing, chanting, and dancing mad. Huh? So they were criticizing him. They were insulting sometimes. And, and he knew that because of who I am, they they are come i've come to deliver them by giving them this maha mantra but because they are offending me they will not be delivered 
So then he thought of this plan of taking sannyas, uh, because in general, uh, in general, but that of course is in the um, Varnashram society, which means the society of those who follow the Vedas, which was the case in India at that time in Bengal, where Lord Chaitanya was, that people were following that culture and they would respect the sannyasi. As soon as they see a sannyasi immediately, dandavats. One has to respect. The, this is enjoined in the scripture that when you see a sannyasi immediately, you must offer respect because he is uh, the top of the social order. He's the top in the social order. And we respect his renunciation, which is a great achievement. So therefore, um, Lord Chaitanya took sannyas, but yeah, it was just a formality. It is not that he had to do it or not like that. He, he just took sannyas for the sake of preaching and for the sake of, for out of mercy to stop the offenses that people were committing against him. Is that okay? Yes, yes, Mataji, because uh, Prabhuji has confirmed that in the chat. He's satisfied. Mm -hmm. So the last question is from Umesh Ingale Prabhuji. Uh, he wants to- Hare Krishna Upendra Prabhu. <laughs> Prabhuji, please, can you unmute? Hare Krishna, Mataji. Hare Krishna, Mataji. Yes. Prabhuji, we can't hear you kindly. Prabhuji, we can't hear you. Kindly take your kindly talk to your children. Can you talk to your children? Mataji Prabhuji is asking, can you offer a gond to Prabhuji? I assume that o offer is... what? Prabhuji, is it gum? A, 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 a keresha? Gond means. Oh, jo, oh, jo nikalta na, Mataji, jo pere se nikalta hai, jise jo gond, gond ke ladu ni banate hai. Ha. Oh, wala gond. Okay, Mataji, it is a, a type of raisin that comes out of the tree. Uh, in English, it is gum akaresia or something like that. So, in... uh, well, it depends what it is because there is a there is a, some uh, <clears throat> uh, what do you say the the sap the sap of the tree in English it's called sap the sap of the tree. Uh, it is actually not offerable. It's not offerable. But there are certain types that we offer, so I don't know what is the distinction, but in general, the sap of the tree is not offerable. M Mataji, this is not a sap of the tree. No, what is it? It's a raisin. It's a raisin that comes out of the tree. So the raisin, is... yeah, it's the sap of the tree, isn't it? The raisin, yeah. Yeah. In general, it's not offerable, but you can research uh, something more because, uh, oops. Mataji, it what looks happened? like this. No, no, I've, I'm sharing my screen. It looks oh, like- Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> it comes out of the tree and it is- The it. gum. Yeah. But this is uh, what you say, uh, and this doesn't come out of the tree. This is cooked or heated and, uh, reduced and then it becomes gum, but originally it's liquid. Hare Krishna, Mataji. Mataji, as you said, Indra, who gave his power to the Rukshoko, did he give his power to the Rukshoko? So, is it because of this reason we can eat this gun? This gun is coming out of the tree and after a few days it becomes dark. It becomes dark. और फिर वो गोंद के लड्डू बनाते हैं ऐसे इसमें तो क्या हम इसको पा सकते हैं या भगवान को भोग लगा सकते हैं? Actually जितना मैं जानती हूँ तो नहीं ऑफर नहीं कर सकते हैं। That is a part of Indra's curse. Yes, exactly. हाँ हम भोग नहीं लगाते हैं उसका। 
ओके और सेकंड माय क्वेश्चन एकादशी के लिए हमने क्या फॉलो करना चाहिए व्हाट इज द स्टैंडर्ड फॉर एकादशी फॉलो स्टैंडर्ड एक्चुअली अकॉर्डिंग टू श्रीला प्रापा श्रीला प्रापा सी देयर आर वेरियस स्टैंडर्ड्स प्रापा गिव अ वेरी सिंपल स्टैंडर्ड क्या मतलब कि इन एकादशी नो ग्रेन्स अन्न एवरीथिंग व्हिच इज अन्न no anna no grains and no beans which means dal and uh, everything which is beans family we don't take that this is what prophet said on ekadasi no rice and no anna means rice and uh, gehum wheat all these things we don't eat grains and we don't eat beans dals all that family that's all what shila prophet gave that's all this is the minimum following of ekadashi if you follow that you're good because the goal of ekadashi is not uh, to just fast the goal of ekadashi is to save time mm, from eating sleeping and so on to engage in more bhajan to engage in more service that's the idea to and to minimize the bodily concept of life huh? so fasting minimizes the bodily concept of life because uh it we have to control the senses hmm? so when you control the senses you disidentify from the body so this is the idea is to disidentify from the body by fasting So there are different levels of fasting, and this is something very personal. The fasting, the minimum is this: no grains, no beans, no dals. This is the minimum. And um, but you can do more than that if you want. You can also fast from all cooked food, for example, or you can eat only fruit if you want. but these are personal choices you see and if you go if you start reading the hari bhakti vilas which is one of our goswami scriptures uh, which has all the do's and don'ts for the vaishnava so many rules and regulations you will find so many things which are forbidden on ekadashi forbidden uh, and so on on, on chaturmasya and all that Shrila Prabhupad did not give that to us because um, it is very difficult to apply in, on on the global level and international level. It's very difficult to apply. Number one, the people will not understand. Like Shrila Prabhupad, for example, in Western countries, um, he said that on Ekadasi you should cook. grains for the public the devotees should eat ekadashi food but the public should eat grains why because you know they are used to eat meat fish eggs with such heavy tastes you know very heavy taste and uh, so and and we are offering vegetarian food prasadam is vegetarian food so this is already disorienting from for them they are not used to that you know they are not used to this they are not used to the taste of that now on top of it if you just give them some ekadashi food which is usually you know very light and um in many cases less tasty you know when you eat rice or you eat bread there is a certain taste to it and and um consistency but then if you eat sama rice or you eat uh, you know quinoa or this thing they'll say there's no taste so in order to attract them uh, uh you have to give them fried food fried paneer fried pakoras fried puris fried in ghee prabha said if you fry in ghee it will take away the taste for smoking and the taste for eating meat so you must fry in ghee and give them grains so that they feel their belly and they feel satisfied 
Otherwise, if you just give them some quinoa or some some sabodana, or you know, they go like, Bleh. yeah. <laughs> and so, what is important? They have come to the temple on Sunday, and it's a kadasi. So, they should they should eat prasadam. Krishna eats grains. And we were saying he doesn't have to take prasana. He doesn't have to take sannyas. He's beyond sannyas. Krishna is also beyond the kadasi. The kadasi is for us. <laughs> it's not for Krishna. So, so uh, uh, the important is that they take prasadam, not that they run away because the food is so tasteless for for them. Stay. So, but if you want to perform austerities. You can on personal level. However, don't preach to everybody that everybody should do near Jalikadasi. This is not good preaching because Prabhupada didn't preach that. He said, no beans, no grains. That's all what he said. So that's practical for preaching. And it's, it's practical in application. Uh, it's, it's easy to apply. Mm. Um, but if you want to be more austere, you can always add something and you can fast from, but nirjala in general is not that good for health. Complete fasting, including from water. It's not very good for health. We do it once a year or something, but otherwise it's uh, not that great. Um, so you can fast with only water that's good. It's very cleansing for the body uh, and certainly helps us disidentify from the body and the body demands. Or you can just take fruit. And the idea in Kalasi is you take only once. You have to understand the principle. The principle is to minimize the bodily demands and to maximize the time for, uh, for um, uh, bhajan and service. This is this is written in the nectar of devotion. That the purpose of ekadasi is to increase remembrance of Krishna. Okay. Hare Krishna Mataji, we have exceeded our time. I'm now handing over to Path Prabhuji. No more questions. Sorry, all devotees. We'll meet again next Saturday and then we can continue. Path Prabhuji, hand over to you, please. Pat Prabhuji, if Pat Prabhuji is not uh, able to uh, unmute uh, Soni Mataji, is it possible for you to end the session? No, he is here, Partha. Okay. Yes, yes, I am here, Mataji. I am here. I am listening. This one. Uh, th thank you, Mataji. Hare Krishna for your wonderful time and session. Also, enlightenment at the Ekadasi day and Hari Prashad and other things. We are so glad to you uh, for your time and association. Uh, I request everyone, please unmute yourself and glorification of Hare Krishna Prasanta Mataji. Please chant Hare Krishna Mantra once. Please join. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Rama. Hare Hare. Hare Hare. Hare Hare. Hare Thank you very much, Pat Prabhuji. And thank you very much, Prashanta Mataji, for joining us. We'll see you again next Saturday. I'll start. Hare Krishna to everyone. Hare Krishna. Thank you for your invitation. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, all devotees who have joined from India. Thank you.